All right, so welcome to this month's edition of Chemical of the Month. Uh, this month's chemical is going to be propane. My name's Todd. My name's Kurt. So uh, we'll jump right into the, uh, the uh, call here. So we're going to reference a call that happened in California recently, very recently, as of yesterday, and where a bobtail was involved in an a-, a car accident. A car struck a bobtail truck, rolled over on the side, and began leaking. So, so you're dispatched to a propane leak from a large container. So we'll get out the charts, get your, get your books and charts, and uh, we'll go through our you know, four-step system you know, tr- as, as a reminder, as a refresher. And, and just as we get into propane, consider this. Not many of us even do research for propane. We go on so many propane calls as it is, we tend not to even think about the hazards or even do, a, do research at all for it. But I would, I would say to you, this is one of those chemicals you really should research, as all of them are, because we tend to forget some of the basic properties and principles of dealing with propane. Yeah, and Todd, think about it. I mean, that's the, it's definitely a chemical that's involved, but a lot of times in the fire service, we think of that as just a flammable right. and a normal. We don't even look at it like a hazmat call. Right. right? Well, most of time we deal with the flip-flops, yeah. board shorts, and beer. We're cooking on the grill. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's, it's one of those right. easy things, right? So we, we, we run through the system. We know where we're going to end up anyway, but just as a re- refresher for the chemical of the month and how to use the charts, we start on chart two. We look for propane. It doesn't. It's not listed in this alphabetical list here. The red arrow points us over to the above the line. So we run through our above line SOG. And just as a reminder about this SOG, this is our standard operating guideline. This is just our prediction of what we could expect from anything above the line, right? So hey, it's a working structure fire until you show up. Yeah, and this, this takes what, 10 seconds to yeah, get to that Absolutely, good 10 second size up. Okay, so it, it's a gas. So our initial isolation zone is gonna be um, 300 feet. It's gonna have vapor pressure. The vapor is gonna be heavier than air. And hey, we expect it to be toxic, measured in parts per million. We expect it to have some flammability, uh, be flammable. We expect it to be corrosive with an, as an acid and contain fluorine. And we expect it to be reactive um, as in polymerization and water and air reactive. And we also are predicting for radioactivity. So we continue on to chart three to continue on with our size up. So in chart three, and remember this, this chart is busy and we want you to focus in on the top left corner, our flammable clue box. So you start like a book? Yeah, like exactly, a book. left to right, okay. exactly here. So up in this top left uh, box, we look for any part of the syllable. So we're looking for propane, prop, and this is a pretty simple chemical name, so it's pretty easy to find. We find it listed here. So it runs us down the list. So we, hit, we find propane here, it runs us to the yes. And remember, the top part of the clue box is for your your your, um, your standard hydrocarbons. So we come down here <clears throat> to um, we're going to end up on red three. So our play is red three, and so and, and just looking real quick, how'd you get the red three? So it ends in A and E. A and E. A and E. Hey, so if it was pro, like propane's crazy cousin, propene, right. right? Hey, that would be red red three P. But this isn't his crazy cousin. This is simply propane. We're hanging on red three ends in A and E. So our hazards are toxic and flammable, and we go to our red background meters. We see that there's no corrosivity, there's no fluorine to deal with. We're not predicting any anyway. And we are telling you to bring your temp gun, and we're telling you to bring your LEL sensor. Again, what we're looking for here is the measurement of any flammable vapors or any reactivity that we are not predicting that would be there. Okay, so real quick, with the safe kit, we should probably take all those five instruments, A- correct? Absolutely. On all the calls? Yep, and remember, just because you're dispatched to a propane incident doesn't mean it's going to end up being a propane incident. Well, I'm sure it, your dispatch was far superior than ours. So well, you never know. I mean, you get good information. I've taken a poll across the country. I'm pretty <laughs> sure everybody has the same issues. Right. right. So we end up in the green background meters. Again, these are the meters with no red lights. And we're predicting, we'd say no red lights as long as you're wearing an SCBA. So this is our FID, our PID, our Freon detectors, tubes and chips, and we get to the KI. So when we end up in, in our turnout, our mission-driven PPE for rescue recon tells us to wear a turnout, level B or level A, depending on who we work for. And if we're in plumbing, turnouts, level B, level A, level C, depending on who we work for as well as far as who issues us what type of gear. So Todd, if I if I didn't have a turnout gear, what could I make entry in? Could I wear a level B or class two suit? So remember, if you don't have turnouts and you're going into a flammable environment, you have red lights to deal with, red, yellow lights and red lights to deal with. So our yellow light, if you're in level B or level A, if you choose level A for this, would be 1% 
for that's a yellow light. Hey, listen, pay attention. It's only going to get higher as you get closer. Two uh, percent of the LEL. It, and if you're in plastic, it's time to get out. You're not going to be effective in this environment. Understood. Yep. Okay. And, and on plumbing and identification, same thing. Turnouts, level B, level A, level C. And again, we teach classes to a lot of people who don't have turnouts as their initial entry gear. And this that would dive further into some of the environmental engineering through ventilation and other tactics we can get into a different class. Sure. And if this leak was outdoors, we could absolutely, you know, push to where we could do some tactics without being absolutely. in the absolutely. 2%, 5%, 10% absolutely. range. We've okay. done a lot of ventilation Good. work. It can absolutely be done. So here, once we, we get through the chart three, it tells us we go into the reference material. So we're going to dive into the reference material. And one of the things about propane that I think tends to trip us all up is that we just simply think it's, it, it's a benign and simple problem. And it's a, it's a gas that we deal with consistently routinely and we uh, we just sort of write it off as a as a non-hazard yeah it's a call you run quite a bit right. you know you get that and that's what we're hoping not to you know get is that complacency if right, you're running exactly. this frequently yep. uh, you know and you don't typically treat it as a hazmat we don't want to see right. any complacency there because complacency leads to right. injuries and it's something to consider uh, more firefighters have been killed responding to propane incidents than many other chemicals that are listed out there and certainly for us hazmat technicians, probably the main one we train against is chlorine. And with more firefighters have been killed dealing with propane than with chlorine. So okay. as we go down the list, we start looking at um, the properties and of propane itself. Okay. So in, I've in got our, my uh, NIOSH here. Excellent. So we'll go down chart seven, a reminder of chart seven. And so we're talking about that we predicted it was going to be a gas, and we were correct. correct? Yes, correct. It says colorless, odorless gas. So it's colorless, colorless and visible. It means invisible, right? Yeah, yeah, visible. So, but it shipped as a what? Liquefied compressed Liquefied gas. Liquefied compressed gas. We're going to come back to that and talk about that here in a second. And we also predicted it would have some vapor pressure. So if it's a gas, we know its vapor pressure is going to be in the atmospheres, correct? Yeah, 8.4 atmospheres, which, you know, I've noticed, I've looked these up in NIOSH, I've noticed sometimes they'll use uh, millimeters of mercury or they'll use atmospheres. Mm -hmm. uh, anytime you say that number atmosphere, it means this thing's readily becoming a gas. Right, so we know we could predict vapors to travel pretty far away from the, uh, the containment uh, area. So um, we also are gonna predict that it's heavier than air. Yeah, so I'm looking at molecular weight, it's 44.1. So air is uh, 29, so, 29. and again, if you forget, it's right here in our charts, right? We always have reminders. For my ourselves. favorite chart, chart yeah, seven. Absolutely, it's the, remind yourself, a, a ODARC 30 chart. <laughs> hey, so we also predict in toxicity, is there some toxicity dealing with propane? So if I look at toxicity here, if you look at IDLH, for example, that's 2100 parts per million. And I think that that's actually 10% LEL, and they, right. they've identified that with 10% LEL. So it's toxicity is also flammable. So burning in a fire is IDLH. Exactly. That, that makes sense. 10%. Right? Yeah. Hey, so we're also predicting um, that we have some flammability. So it, we know about propane enough to go without even really digging deep. <laughs> hey, it says flammable. As a matter of fact, it's pretty dependable, isn't it? Yeah. And we can always get it to light. So 2.1% to 9.5% is pretty good flammable range. Right. That LEL is pretty low, so it's pretty flammable at lower levels. Right. Know, right so we, we know we know that uh, we got fire hazards to deal with. Um, are we predicting any corrosivity? Now that this is a gas, so we can look at the corrosive gas guides, and the get corrosive gas guide just for a refresher: 118, 123, 124, 125. Yeah. And I'm looking at 115 here, yeah, so, so it's not a corrosive, not a corrosive gas. gas. But remember, don't leave the pH paper on the truck because this may not be right. propane. There may be something else. Is there any F in the formula? Uh, if I'm looking at the formula, it's all carbon and hydrogen. Right. It's a bunch so of them. Yep, so there's no Fs. So how about polymerization under reactivity? I'm looking at three different spots for polymerization. I'm looking for the P after the DOT number. I don't see it. I looked in the formula, and I don't see an equal sign. And I'm looking down here in that incompatibilities and reactivities, or that freaky box, if this chemical does anything freaky. It's going to be in there, and all I see is strong oxidizers. Excellent. So we're not, we're not going to see any polymerization. So how about reactivity? Um, we said the guide number was 115, so that's not 161 through 166. Yeah, and it's, it's not, not radioactive, right? right? So 161 through 166, radioactivity, so right. I don't see that. How about the, when, under the explosive guides, it's not 112, 113, 114 either. So. Okay, it's 115, yeah. we're good? Yep. Yeah. So again, it's just refresh your memory on the charts itself. 
So if we're looking at this, what do we have? A toxic, flammable gas. gas. Right. Okay. Now, so one of the things that we want to push, and, and, re, re, and this is our size up, and we know we're going to enter in this environment in our bunker gear and SCBA, as our, that's our highest level of protection for this particular chemical. Right. Right? So we got an overturned truck. Driver's pinned. Um, we got propane that's leaking. So we got a pretty exciting incident here to deal with. And one of, the, one of the things we want to push and have a takeaway here is that does anywhere on that page, does it tell you, hey, these properties only matter if there's this much or more of the propane? Is it, does this matter for if it's an ounce or 90 tons? Is yeah, it the same? I, I, whatever size container doesn't matter, the properties stay the same. Right. So. so if we understand the behavior of propane, no matter the size of the container it's in or how much right. of it there is, we can predict how it's going to go. Right. Okay. So, one of the things that we want to talk, I want to talk about this uh, shipped as a compressed liquefied gas. So, this, I want to look at uh, something important here, the boiling point. What was the boiling point of this stuff? The boiling point on this is minus 44 degrees Fahrenheit. It's a pretty So, low. when you think about the laws of physics here, a liquid can never exist as a liquid at temperatures above its boiling point unless it's under pressure. Ooh, that's getting pretty deep. Yeah, pretty crazy, isn't it? <laughs> so, but if the, if the liquid, it stays a liquid inside the container because it's under pressure. Right. And so that liquid assumes the ambient temperature that it sits in, correct? I understand, yeah. So you could have propane riding down the road or sitting at your house in 70 degrees weather or 80 degree weather or 100 degree weather or even 20 degree weather. So when you think about the the liquid inside that propane cylinder is going to it's going to assume the ambient temperature. Right. And so based on a rule of thumb, and it's a, a very loose rule of thumb, for every one degree temperature you have two psi. Okay. So uh, uh, if it's 70 degrees outside, you can say the pressure would be 140 psi. Okay. Inside the cylinder. So uh, another a rule of thumb here, or not even a rule of thumb, but laws of physics. If pressures rise, temperatures rise. If temperatures rise, pressures rise. If they fall, they both fall together, they both rise together. This is an important property to keep in mind in dealing with propane. So if you have a propane cylinder on its side, no matter the size, whether it's a 20 pound cylinder or it's a, a 240 gallon tank or it's a 2000 gallon tank rolling down the road, the properties of propane do not change based right. on the volume. They are temperature dependent completely. What about those new taller cylinders that you're starting to see at the service stations? If they're in a taller cylinder versus one that's laying down, does that make a difference? Not a difference at all. A difference. It's the temperature okay. of the liquid in the, in the side of the cylinder. To make a difference to the surface area, it's, it's all the same. Okay. So the key point here is this. If there is a vapor leak, meaning vapors are leaving the cylinder, remember these vapors were colorless, right? right. Another word for that is invisible, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's a vapor leak, we won't see the vapor cloud. But if pressure is leaving the cylinder, what's happening to the temperature and the pressure inside the cylinder? Yeah, it's starting it's, to It's reduce. going down. Yeah. So if that temperature drops all the way down to its boiling point, which if you consider this, if you had a boiling pot of water on a stove inside a pressure cooker, and you took the lid off the pressure cooker, the water would drop down to 212 degrees, its boiling point but it wouldn't completely evaporate. Well, this is what happens to propane as well. Okay. So if, if the pressure leaves the cylinder, the temperature of the propane drops down to negative 44 if enough pressure, if enough vapors leave. So you could have a violent leak happening, meaning a loud hissing sound and all the sounds of a major problem, and you arrive on scene and it sounds like, hey, there's nothing here anymore. But there very well could be a lot of the propane left. And this would be indicated you can take your, take your temperature gun, shoot the bottom layer of the temperature of the tank, okay. and if this shows negative 44, that propane's auto refrigerated. You still have a problem. You still have propane in there, but the cylinder's at a safer point now. Now we just got to worry about how do we offload this thing and how do we uh, get rid of the propane. All right, Todd. So what's that term called again? So when uh, it's called auto refrigeration. Okay. And so when that's all the pressure leaves the cylinder, and the propane has dropped down to its boiling point. So that, that's a vapor leak. And so something, something else to consider, the other side of that coin would be a liquid leak. So something that's of major importance to keep in mind here, if there's any pressure on the cylinder and it's a leak from the liquid side, all the liquid is gonna leave that cylinder before the pressure runs out. Okay. And that, that's huge information right there because 
that's a that's, remember the liquid coming out. It's expanding 270 times itself. Correct. Right. That's the expansion ratio. Something else to consider: the liquid is no longer under pressure. So we just said the laws of physics are applicable here. Sure. That liquid, when it hits the atmosphere, it drops a negative 44. That's frostbite. So um, some, not only is it a flammable gas, but if you try to get up close to it, try to sort of valve off, it's got ice forming around it, um, you stand the chance of really in, in dealing with some frostbite injuries as well as very high potential for flammability. Right. Um, something as we push in, the, in our classes, our propane IQ classes, we talk a lot about the behavior of propane. And if you understand the behavior of propane, dealing with the cylinder sizes, it becomes a plumbing issue. We would encourage any and all people to take our uh, propane IQ class. It's a two-day program, a lot of hands-on, live propane leaks, fixing live propane uh, situations. Um, if, what do you guys think? Do you have that. a kit or something that you use? We have a, okay. a propane A kit, propane B kit. Propane A kit handles DOT cylinders. Propane B kit handles ASME cylinders. And, uh, again, it's hands-on, about 50% 50, 50 hands-on. Uh, very good training. All right, Todd, good information. Let's get back to the call. All right, so the, the call ended up here was um, as described by the, the uh, state trooper on scene that he, he said that the leak, that the ambient cool air helped the leak uh, basically be minimized. Okay. So he said that he saw that there was a, it was freezing down, it was getting cold. Was there some rain at the time as well? So it, it, so it was cool and damp weather. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, as we look at, it sounds like this may have been a vapor leak that was causing auto refrigeration on the cylinder. So um, here with the pin driver, you got your first end cruise. Let's, let's make an aggressive approach, but you're approaching a flammable gas. So you're in full turnout SCBA. You got to bring a hose line, dry chemical extinguisher, push the vapors, gain access to your, your driver, and get them out as quickly as you can. And then re re head back into solving the problems. Right. That's a, that's a good call, and I think that happens more frequently. One of the other dangers, I think, with auto refrigeration is the fact that if you think that leak is stopped, and I think this has happened to responders, you think that leak is stopped and it's auto refrigerated, how much product still left in the tank? It's about a lot. About half of what you yeah. started with. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the product. So as it warms up again, right. the leak starts slow and builds up, builds up, builds up, and gets to be a large leak again yep. until eventually it tries to auto refrigerate. Absolutely. So that's a, that's a dangerous run for responders if you mistakenly think this thing is done and it's not done leaking, right? you know, you might get called back or you might get injured or, or right. hurt, you know, killed. So uh, securing the correct valve is, is really important here. So knowing which adapters to attach or which valve to shut off is, is vital here. Yep. Good, good call. Absolutely. Yep, so we're, uh, thank you for uh, tuning in for this month's Chemical of the Month. I'm Todd. I'm Kurt. We'll catch you next month.